and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for another free SCMH webinar. Today's topic is going to be applying remote technologies to audits and product acceptance. It's section 715 of the SCMH. We have four panelists, all of whom are going to introduce themselves as they speak today. If this is your first SCMH experience, um, you can go to the IAQG.org website and learn more. You can click on SCMH. There's an about page and you can download today's guidance um, and check it out. But I'll be back at the end as well as walking you through the different sections of this webinar to read your questions to the panelists. So I said, like I said, can answer as many as possible. We'll also have a demo today that will be up front pretty soon that uh, we'll be sharing with you of the tool. So here's where I was telling you about the IAQG.org, SCMH. Click on that and you can take you right to the SCMH with all the guidance. There's several topic links. You can see plan and manage, design and development, uh, make, buy, deliver, customer support, all of which are hot links to take you to the list of topics that we have pulled together under uh, each section. Within the plan and manage, you'll go to 715, which is the blind remote technologies. And there you will find all of our guidance today. So we'll be discussing the topic, getting into some of the details of each of the elements within that topic. And as I said, we will show you also a demonstration of the risk management tool. Then we'll go right into the live Q&A and time permitting, we'll do a little bit more about the SCMH itself. So let's get started. Dennis, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Sue. Good, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. This is Dennis Jolly. I'm with uh, Spirit Aerosystems Supply Quality. Um, and uh, I led the team to uh, um, accumulate all best practices uh, for this uh, subject matter and uh, pull them into a, uh, um, a process by which to help uh, mitigate risk uh, when performing remote uh, activities. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> the team, the information in this guidance is a culmination of a dedicated team effort. Uh, uh, IAQG sector member companies, uh, international government and industry subject matter experts. Uh, we didn't stay just within the member companies. Um, as you can tell by the, by the uh, staff here that we have, um, the panelists. Uh, the guidance includes a mixture of the best practices currently used in AS and D. The uh, origin of need, um, the due to the pandemic travel restrictions um, prevented quality assurance from team from being able to effectively support the supply base and maintaining compliance with audits, first articles and source inspection, among other things. Um, the solution was to implement a virtual process utilizing existing hardware, for example, cell phones, tablets and laptops to facilitate audits, product acceptance and quick response problem communication. I believe Mr. Tommy uh, will take care of this section. Hello, yeah, thanks, Dennis. My name is Tommy Maxwell. I work at the Boeing Company, and I'm the team lead for the internal audit organization uh, for Boeing commercial airplanes. Uh, as Dennis talked about, you know, a little bit of background. Whenever COVID started, you know, we really needed to find a solution to be able to continue our audit and product acceptance activity while a lot of folks were not allowed to be in person um, in a work environment. So uh, the team has had to get really creative. And as the member companies came together to talk about some of the best practices that we've built within our organizations, uh, we decided to put these all together into a common place. So anyone out in industry could go out and review some of the best practices being used in a lot of the big companies out there. And, and even in some of the smaller companies, we all really learn from each other during this activity. 
Uh, and now that in this environment that COVID sort of changed the environment a bit, this team's also considered now that we're in more of a hybrid environment and not so much like a disaster response uh, to COVID crisis, how can we leverage those best practices and create some guidance to really be helpful to industry? This process overview that you're looking at now kind of outlines sort of the stages of how uh, a remote audit or product acceptance activity might look. Uh, everything from data collection all the way through follow-up and documentation activities. Um, this particular uh, demonstration that we're going to share today and probably a lot of your questions will be around the documented guidance and in, in the risk assessment tool or the risk uh, mitigation tool. So thank you very much and uh, I'll pass it off to Sylvia, I believe. Um, thank you, Tommy. Hello, everyone. So my name is Sylvie Pra, and I work for Hervis Helicopters in France. And I'm part of this uh, working team on this topic uh, with expertise on product acceptance. So here are the available guidance and tool that you can find on the SCMH uh, web page. So we have uh, SCMH 7.15.1 which is the overview of applying remote technology to audits and product acceptance. We have uh, SCMH 7.15.2, uh, which provide guidance for uh, applying remote technology to audits and product acceptance. And finally, we have SCMH 7.15.3, which is the risk tool that has been developed. Uh, I now hand over to Dennis. Thank you very much, Sylvie. <clears throat> the, uh, the risk tool was developed um, based on uh, everybody's uh, best practices. So um, it's, it's a way to accumulate uh, your thoughts and um, develop a pro internal process as needed. So uh, as you can see here uh, with the bubble in the upper right hand corner, it says note that all yellow fields in this guidance um, that guidance document are available for input. So uh, what you would respond to, uh, to the questions here to um, start uh, your, your risk analysis. And the fields have that have a question mark state either select a response or not rated, all contain drop down selections. So the drop down selections actually trigger responses in other fields. So please use the, uh, the, the drop downs. Um, the four document, the four boxes here right below the uh, bubble are guidance um, documents that uh, you can go into like uh, for the first on the left hand side is the mutual agreement guidelines that uh, give you a quick overview, just uh, kind of a thought process to go through to say um, what uh, what would satisfy the mutual agreement between myself or my company and the companies I'm going to either audit or perform um, product acceptance. Um, additionally, there are uh, documentation of evidence guidelines, uh, again, recommendations. Um, and then on the bottom left is uh, planning guidelines, which uh, the, uh, the amount of planning that goes into a virtual audit um, is, is exponentially more than on a normal audit because you have uh, the technology um, variation that a uh, variable that adds to that. So please review that. Um, and then the bottom right hand corner is uh, click here to view the technology guidelines. That's the technology guidelines that gives you an idea of what you need to have before you can per uh, perform an on site or, or a remote uh, audit or product acceptance. Once you've satisfied your, your questions in the yellow boxes on the left-hand side, uh, then you would either click uh, on the purple box to go to uh, a product acceptance assessment, risk assessment, or to uh, on the pink one to go down to uh, 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 perform a risk analysis on the remote audit. Right beneath that on the same page is a remote assessment report that accumulates all of the responses in the uh, remote product acceptance uh, risk analysis or the audit risk analysis. 
So for this example, um, the, the red turned not acceptable because the audit or product acceptance capability rating before mitigation actions put in place were not acceptable for one reason or another. Um, and then the um, audit or product acceptance capability rating after mitigation was put in place was acceptable based on um, hopefully more than one person's feedback on uh, mitigating the risk. So with that, the overall acceptance was acceptable. Um, so based on the risk analysis, you have um, a, a, a high probability that the either the audit or the uh, product acceptance can occur. Uh, note that there's another out here. Um, what evidence exists that indicates a remote audit or product acceptance cannot be carried out or may be able unable to fully achieve the events requirements. Um, so if, if there are more risks that are outside of the um, defined uh, risks in this tool, then you can define that here and then either mitigate them or or perform the on-site. And then uh, again, it asks one more time, do the mitigating actions ensure that all of the audit or product acceptance requirements can be fully met and sufficient objective evidence will be available for achieving the objectives? If that answer is yes, then you can go ahead with that. Um, and then this would be a drop down here, believe it or not. And uh, once you select uh, a, a remote audit can go ahead, you would sign it or approve it. Um, and then the date of your conclusion. Um, and that would be your objective evidence that it met the, the criteria. Uh, this is an example portion of the um, remote audit feasibility assessment tool. Uh, again, you can see that, that you have a, a link back to the assessment report, so you can go back and forth. Uh, and then you have the other planning and guideline, uh, guidelines up here. So the mutual agreement, planning, technology, and documentation. So you have those as reference to be able to go down and go through the questions. Uh, for this example, we selected uh, an, a false statement here. It did not comply with uh, section 1.15, so it was not eligible. So um, a, a mitigation had to be put in place. That was deemed acceptable, and that's what turned the before mitigation red, after mitigation was green. And that in the, uh, form, uh, in the uh, slide before where you saw that it was not acceptable. This is the reason it was not acceptable. So you have that objective evidence to go back to. <clears throat> and then with that, uh, I believe Sue's gonna do a demonstration of the SCMH tool. And- uh, Hello everybody. It Thanks goes- Jolly. I'm with Spirit Aero System Supply Quality. Today I'll be presenting an overview of 7.15.3, Applying Remote Technologies to Audit and Product Acceptance Risk Tool. Um, you can find this on the SMH site um, and it provides a, uh, a risk analysis uh, to help you determine your processes with regard to remote auditing and remote product acceptance. Uh, the introduction here shows uh, the risk identification mitigation process as it's broken down into several uh, separate sections and then some questions to um, help with uh, determining uh, if you're going to have a problem with, uh, with activity at your facility. So with that uh, to begin you would click there it takes you to the uh, second tab which is the data collection uh, where you would fill out um, sections one and two and provide a response in the yellow shaded fields um, as identified by the um, pop bubble here would be note that all yellow fields in this guidance um, are available for input. Uh, fields that have a question mark, state select a response or not rated all contain drop down selections. Fields that do not have drop down selections require information to be typed in. 
So these entities would uh, require information to be typed in. And down here, you would see an example, select a response, uh, where you would select a response, yes or no. Or for this one, you would select a response to be determined remote audit can go ahead or a remote audit cannot go ahead. So uh, the, uh, this form and this sheet also provide um, access to the four support documents. So here are some guidelines to, for mutual agreements, uh, for documentation of evidences, and, uh, technology guidelines, and planning guidelines. So uh, we start with bottom right, go to technology, uh, where you would go through and determine um, what risk the, these items um, would, would entail on your, at your facility or at your, uh, uh, during your activity. So you would select a response so that you can um, determine what you need to do or actions that you might need to take. Uh, you can click here to go back to your uh, data collection sheet, uh, complete this documentation. Again, planning guidelines, this is real important because a remote audit uh, takes a lot more planning than uh, an on-site audit. Uh, just because of the uh, um, amount of effort required to uh, see what's going on out on the floor. So um, the uh, remote assessment report is located in the bottom section of this and uh, it automatically populates with uh, your acceptance capability rating before, acceptance rating after mitigation, and then you make the final determinations here and here. So do all the mitigating actions, ensure that all audit and product acceptance requirements can be fully met, uh, and su sufficient objective evidence will be available for achieving the objectives. This is a real important statement because you have to be able to um, meet all, be able to achieve all the objectives. So you would select that response here. A no response uh, would of course uh, require uh, a complete failure of the process. So with that, let's just say we were going to do a remote audit. So we would click here. It would take you to the remote audit feasibility assessment tool um, where you would uh, look at the criteria, um, eligibility criteria. Here's uh, uh, an example. Travel to a specific location is not possible for company mandated health or safety reasons applicable to all personnel, visitors, company, authority imposed travel restrictions, et cetera. Um, if the answer to that question is true, then uh, you're, it's eligible and it's acceptable up here. If uh, you determine that that answer is false, then it would turn it red, it would make it not acceptable, um, and then you would have to uh, uh, develop a mitigation plan and document it here, or you can attach other uh, information if you need to. Um, once you determine if that uh, mitigation plan is acceptable, you would rate it here as being capable, for example, and uh, this uh, would show that, number one, you had a non-acceptable non um, risk uh, prior to mitigation, but after mitigation, it was acceptable, and that's documented here and here. Again, uh, if you go back to the remote assessment report, it shows that here as well, that it was not acceptable before, but it was acceptable afterwards. Um, and you use that to finish out the report. Let's go back to our remote audit. Um, as we're going through all of the questions, you determine that um, there's a question that is missing. So, uh, or you needed to add information, that's easily done. You right click and insert a row. Um, and then if you grab the top one and drag it all the way down, it automatically numbers. Um, and then you would put your question here. Um, and you, would, you can go up here and highlight the rest of this and drag it down to bring down the formatting and the information. So um, if true, it turns it eligible and it also 
updates here. So that way you can customize this however you like. Um, and if uh, if you if the wording it becomes confusing, um, if you look here at this um, formula, you can see rating um, is a is a field. So it would go and look that up, look up that information in in the field uh, in the named range of rating. If you type in opposite. Opposite rating. Uh. Sorry about that. You can see that it turns it uh, not eligible. So you can you can adjust the the logic as needed just by adding the word opposite to all of the uh, to the formula so um, that way you can have the logic so that it makes sense to you and your team okay so with that we had a non eligible or not acceptable condition after mitigation, everything else was green. It was acceptable. You go here to your assessment report, and that's where you would make a uh, determination if evi what evidence exists that indicates a remote audit or product acceptance cannot be carried out or may be un unable to be fully achieve the uh, events requirements. You would document that here. And again, do the mitigating actions, ensure that all of the auditor product acceptance requirements can be fully met and subjective, sufficient objective evidence will be available for completing the objective. Answer yes. And you can answer down here. Uh, you can um, get, have management buy off or um, um, document the reason that you selected a response that uh, the audit can go ahead and then document who it was approved by and then the date of conclusion. The inf other information that we have available is in a tab called source data. That's where all the named ranges are. Everything is color coded or most everything is color coded. So the uh, before and after product acceptance, for example, is the purple. And then uh, the salmon color over here is for remote audit. Um, so that you can see the logic in there if you need to. Uh, but note that if you delete anything over here, it will affect uh, information all over in the entire spreadsheet. So. Um, if you have any questions, though, you can uh, send me a note and I'd be happy to uh, help you work through it. So with that, um, I hope there are questions so that we can uh, make this a better tool. If you uh, if you see an improvement, uh, please send it my way. I'll be happy to uh, implement it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dennis. So this tool and document provide guidance on the use of uh, remote information communication technology or ICT to perform audits and product acceptance. But please keep in mind that this is the responsibility of the organization to assess whether the use of remote ICT constitute a suitable alternative to a physical audit or acceptance of a product. Indeed, careful consideration and risk management should be applied and some contractual aspects and or mutual agreements should be considered. When eligible, a risk analysis should be performed and for this you can refer to the SCMH 7.15.3 risk tool which has just been presented to you by Dennis. But also all regulatory and company safety policy should be taken into account consideration through the process and the import and export compliance should be validated.
a full cooperation should be expected with measures related to confidentiality and security. And for this, it is recommended that a written agreement, contract or other document be signed between the parties involved for remote audits and product acceptance, stating that it will be completed remotely. And it should also include the description of the process, a list of documentation, it should uh, describe the time frame and other special requirements like training, customer approval, confidentiality, and so on. You can refer to the checklist for mutual agreement, which is available in the SCMH 7.15.3 risk tool uh, in the specific tab, as already shown. As far as the planning is concerned, some adaptation should be applied since it would require more time and efforts. Indeed, remote technology can be challenging for some users. As a result, it could be time consuming and frustrating and may impair in results. Uh, that's why the audit and inspection planning should be detailed and include all relevant features to ensure compliance with the scope and criteria of the event. Indeed, the agenda needs to detail time points, methods, and techniques, just as an agenda on site. It should contain appropriate breaks, time to collect evidence, and others. ICT issues should also be taken into consideration with a backup solution ready. But applying remote technology should be considered as an opportunity and deviation from the audit path should also be considered as needed during the interview. And here again, the checklist for planning can be found on the SEMH 7.15.3 risk tool in the specific tab. Thank you very much. I now hand over to Tracy. Would you like please to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Sylvie. Hello to everybody listening in. My name is Tracy Murray and I'm a Government Quality Assurance Representative with the United Kingdom Ministry of Defence. I was sponsored to participate as a guest member in this team by B Systems, who are a member uh, company of the IEQG. So I'm going to talk a little bit about remote audit preparation and conducting the audit. In general, preparation for remote audit or product acceptance takes more time than face-to-face -face activities, so consideration should be given to the following. Documentation. Uh, ensure all procedures, objective evidence and any documents to be reviewed, such as test certificates, purchase orders and any other mandatory documents are available in digital form. You don't want to be mucking about with paper copies on the day and not be able to get them uh, when you're doing remote activities. So you should prepare a list of the documents to be sent in advance. Uh, ideally, you should seek to review as much of the documentation as possible prior to remote audit or product acceptance. And this will reduce the amount of time that you actually spend on the remote activity. You should always use encrypted email or a secured uh, shared working environment to uh, send sensitive and classified documents so that you don't break any security protocols or um, any um, commercial sensitivities. The information and communications technology, ICT software and hardware to be utilised to be identified, agreed and appropriate for the remote audit or the acceptance activity. Some technology considerations that you might want to think about are, does the visual resolution allow clear viewing of the process and product features? A minimum resolution of 720p um, is recommended for most instances. Is the bandwidth capable of supporting the remote activity, especially when you're using live video streaming? Can the activity be performed using meeting software packages only, or is there a requirement for virtual presence software? These types of software will be discussed in the following slides. A dry run of the ICT should be performed to ensure that the equipment um, and setup are reliable and effective. The, the, the objective of the dry run is to test the Wi-Fi and cellular connections and also to ensure that participants are proficient in the use of the technology. The quality of the remote connection will have a direct impact on the effectiveness of the remote activity. And always have a plan of action for when a breakdown in remote communications occurs and if possible, always have a backup ICT or device.
As a minimum, you would expect the required hardware to do a remote activity would be a computer, a cellular phone. This is always handy for when your computer or your connection issues arise and a stable Wi-Fi or a cellular connection. Um, it's essential that you have two-way communication for an effective remote audit or product acceptance. Other optional equipment that you may want to consider is image stabili stabilization equipment such as virtual reality glasses or gimbals for cameras, recorders, tablets to ensure that you don't get any shaky pictures. And a blue Bluetooth speaker or headset might be useful in some instances as well. There are obviously other advanced equipment and emerging technologies that you can select from in, in your remote activities. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, the most common types of ICT software in use are virtual presence software and meeting software, and we'll talk a bit about each of these. Um, virtual presence software, there are many available virtu virtual presence software options that are out there, and the team doesn't promote any preferred software at all, but there are a lot of different packages um, that are used in industry already. Virtual presence software allows auditors to view parts and processes in real time, so you can have virtual tours, and when you combine it with the support and hardware, such as 360 degrees cameras, high resolution video, virtual reality headset, it gives you a full immersive experience like you're actually there, you know, in the factory or the shop floor. The virtual presence software also facilitates the accumulation of objective evidence as required, and you can actually often validate that at the time of, of the remote activity as well. It's important that lighting sources and sound environment uh, are appropriate for the event. Uh, because poor lighting and excessive background noise may impair the effectiveness and the outcome of the remote activity. Um, I'm sure many of us use meeting software on our day-to-day -day basis to hold meetings, review documents, make arrangements, uh, preparations. That's no different from when you apply it to remote audit and product acceptance. We do exactly similar activities like that using meeting software as well. You can conduct interviews, you can review documents online, you can hold your pre-meetings, you can hold your um, audit wash-ups as well, all by done by meeting software. So conducting the audit itself, um, I think it is important to understand the limitations of any remote audit or product acceptance and try to mitigate for these. Remote audit techniques are not always entirely conducive to the natural dynamic flow of audit discussions, which would occur during face-to-face -face surveillance. Um, so you need to have a sort of a, a planned full audit scope, try to follow a defined audit path and adhere to a schedule as much as possible. But you should recognise that there will be instances where you may identify potential non-conformances in adjacent areas and you have to deviate from your audit path. So it's important that you remember to come back to that, that path and try and maintain your time scales as, as much as possible. But you should also take cognizance of each individual's circumstances and accept that there may be distractions that's going on at either end, your end or their end. There's always distractions that happens when you're using remote technology and you have to be prepared for those and um, just, just try to proceed as well as you can. And a final point on this, um, be respectful with information communication technology. It's important to establish who's, who's present at both ends during remote audits. Ensure that you know who you're speaking to at any given time and always request permission and notify the auditee prior to using any pictures, videos or screen captures. This may not be permitted due to security protocols or commercial sensitivities. Um, I'm now going to hand you back to Sylvie um, for the next slide on safety. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. So please do not forget that safety remains first always, and the safety aspects are to be considered. Indeed, the introduction of remote ICT increases safety risk. So the environment has to be carefully monitored, for instance, while holding the camera or using noise cancelling headphones or dealing with a specific items. People are to be cognizant of uh, safety hazards all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, I now hand over to you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Sylvie. And just to summarize that uh, remote auditing takes a lot more time and patience. Uh, don't expect to uh, uh, have a quick audit or assessment. 
um, because of the amount of planning, especially uh, beforehand. So the more you can accomplish during prep and planning, uh, the more successful the audit will be. Um, compare documentation to requirements. Uh, a best practice is to compare the documentation to the requirements and then focus on areas perceived as needing help or if compliance is questioned. Uh, one of, one of uh, my best practices is to uh, use uh, the meeting software to uh, go over the scope and identify uh, areas of concern uh, based on the procedures and processes that I'm auditing and then use the virtual presence software to go out and have that uh, exercised on the floor to see how, if they are compliant or if they're not compliant. So, and in breaking it up that way, um, it gives you more time to recover from seasickness because uh, if you can imagine the, uh, the video moving. Um, so you, uh, you have a, um, you focus on a, a procedure or a section of a procedure and then you go out uh, and have the video uh, virtual presence on the floor um, to watch them accomplish that and then go back to the meeting and discuss and then go to your next section. So um, do not take discovery for granted. Do not restrict yourself to a rigid audit path. Um, you know, when you're walking through an, um, an audit path, um, now when you're on site, you know, you look to your left and right and you, you look for um, expired containers, um, you know, people not uh, performing the tasks correctly. You walk over and talk to people. Um, use your virtual presence software to do that same thing. You know, don't, don't say, stay strictly on that audit path um, and, and use it to interview others because you don't want to just have feedback from one person. Uh, use of a camera on shop floor in limited sessions as, as it is tiring and can induce motion sickness. And, uh, it, and it does. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, anyway, um, any questions that you would have on this at this time? Oh, and then pro tips, uh, uh, you know, based on feedback and based on experience. So uh, always have a backup plan in case of problems because you are going to have problems. There's going to be a thunderstorm. There's going to be um, um, a cellular outage. There's going to be um, uh, an IT issue. Uh, so always have a backup plan. Uh, test your bandwidth in the audit path. Um, during your dry run, have the person just walk the audit path and see if you're going to be able to uh, um, view everything that you're going to need to view. Um, conduct a test call prior to the audit uh, or inspection. Make sure that the inspection area is well lit and the, the um, camera will be able to pick up the uh, nuances of the part and uh, um, you can make an, make an assessment and compare it to the engineering. Um, need resolution of at least 720p or higher. Uh, so you can read signs, thermocouples, monitors, et cetera. So you can see FOD in sealant. You can see FOD in, a, in, a, in tubing, um, et cetera. So you want to be able to have a clear uh, resolution. It is not always necessary to take pictures or record video. In fact, we discourage it um, because you don't take a picture when you're walking through on a regular audit. Um, you know, you have your objective evidence, you have your plan. Um, if it's necessary to take a picture, it would be nice to be able to share that picture with the uh, auditee so that you can discuss it later. Um, but uh, I would say it, it would, on a rare occasion uh, that you would need to take a picture or video or record video. Allow supplier to turn off camera if they're in a sensitive or proprietary areas. Remember, we're, we're invading their space, so uh, they need to be able to have that control and they need to be, it needs to be communicated to them that they, they are in control of their camera. Um, break up being on the floor is it can become tiring uh, and uh, battery life is, uh, is another thing that, uh, that's pretty tough. So break it up as much as possible. Like I was saying earlier, if you have uh, a documentation review, 
go out on the floor and review that uh, process and then come back. Uh, so uh, use of meeting software to start the meeting and set scope and then transition to the virtual presence as we discussed earlier. And then again, um, can't say this enough, expect connections to break and call back when it happens. Um, it, uh, it, it will happen and then you go back to your your backup plan in case you can't call back on that uh, on that device. Um, and then if you need to take a lunch or something to allow somebody to recharge their phone or have a, a battery pack close by to support. Thank you, Dennis and Tracy and Sylvie and Tommy for uh, presenting these few slides and going through the demo. It's much appreciated by those sending us little notes right now. And I do have some questions that I will take care of. The earlier questions came in that I will take care of uh, after a few questions directly to the par panelists. So Dennis, and as part of the prep, would you inform the oddity that you will ask to see calibration or shelf life labels during the video and agree a remote agenda? Hi, Rob, thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, you would uh, let them know that uh, during the audit, it, it will be just like being uh, on site uh, using virtual presence. Um, and you will be able to see, clearly see the, uh, uh, the labels, the calibration uh, labels uh, during the video. Um, and if they have a problem with that, then the audit cannot con uh, be conducted uh, to, because that, to me, that's a, an important part of the audit. Thank you. What if auditee does not want to show something on camera when asked on the floor? Not necessarily a prop proprietary issue, how, how to handle? I think you just responded. <laughs> it can't continue. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip, uh, for that. Uh, absolutely, if, if it's part of the scope of the audit then, and they don't want to uh, uh, provide that, uh, that view, then uh, you would, uh, if you can't successfully complete the scope, the entire scope of the audit, then you would need to perform an on-site audit. Thank you. While we're waiting for a few more questions to come in, I'm going to respond to the earlier questions by showing you the next couple slides. So you were asking where can we get a copy of this demonstration or their presentation slides or this recording even. Um, our structure is built in a way that as you go into the SCMH and top, you know, click on any of the topics that are of interest to you, which by the way, those topics are brought to you as priorities from the industry. So if somebody comes forward or we hear a lot of chatter on a particular thing like remote technology for audits, um, we develop a team under the S for the SCMH that will write the guidance and then present it rather quickly um, in the form of the, the overviews and the guidance documents or the tools that we create as part of that team. And then once we're done, we start to put them under core or toolbox. So the main guidance would be under core. The tools would be under the toolbox. Up here under webinars, you'll see the webinar recordings. But the presentations themselves are also in the toolbox. For this particular one, when we show you, uh, if I can have time to go live, we'll do the 715. It says webinars and demonstrations. And under that, you'll see the demonstration that we shared to you with you today for that particular tool. And then we'll also log put the webinar in there uh, soon. So you see all the webinars, the tools in the toolbox. Uh, we've got some in the past year, probably six now. This is makes number seven of uh, the webinars that we've done, the recent webinars. And uh, all of them are located in the SCMH, Advanced Product Quality Planning the acceptance authority media, the business continuity management, work transfer management, competency management. Last week was data science and artificial intelligence. And then today's will go in soon as well. The one that the people are asking about is the, how do I ask Dennis a question? Well, there's a feature called the contact SCMH. Right here, you can hit about SCMH, learn about it, 
You can search the topics. You'll see the communication pack, the alphabetical listing, what's new. And then right here on any page within the SCMH, you'll see a contact SCMH. So by, by clicking on that, you're going to send an email directly to me. And if the topic happens to be applying remote technology, I'm going to forward it on to Dennis. Dennis will be able to reply to you directly. So if you have a question to answer the person that asked, um, what's Dennis's email? For this case, for anything in the SCMH, please send them to the contact SCMH and I'll get it out to the right person, whether that be for any of the topics, APQP, any of them. Okay. So if I go back now, let's see if there's any other questions coming in. What is your what is your experience in scheduling remote audits in different time zones? Time shifts of about nine hours can be challenging and stretching the audit on several days is my experience. Do you have any best practices? Thank you for that, Andrea. Uh, I have the same experience that you do. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, different time zones, uh, they, they usually take longer. Um, because of the, the time zone and, and there's not enough coffee in the world to keep me awake. Um, so uh, the, uh, the time shifts is, is challenging um, and uh, break it into um, different sections. I'm sure you've probably already done that um, and, and hit them uh, all as quick as, as uh, early in the, in the audit as possible so that you can have the last couple of days to um, answer any questions or or dig into any um, uh, nonconformities that you find. Thank you. And I'm going to, I don't see a lot of questions, so I think you did a fantastic job demonstrating the tool and sharing the guidance. Um, I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists if they'd like to share any ex specific experience or uh, have anything that they've received questions from in general about this topic and would like to share. Tommy, Tracy, Sylvie, Dennis, this is open floor. Well, I'd just like to Thank say, you. as Tracy, uh, sorry, um, you know, talking from my experience, I, uh, I obviously um, work in a slightly different environment, although I am visiting suppliers all the time. So it was really useful for me to come in and learn um, best practice from outside industry across you know a number of different industries. I'm actually the process owner and within my own organization for remote audit. So it's been useful. I can now take away all this good practice and um, develop it you know within our own our own business processes here. But there was quite a, a widespread um, during, during the early discussions and sharing of information and the way that people do things, um, which I find you know um, not, not wouldn't say surprising. But, um, it, you know, you can't cater for every eventuality, every surveillance, every audit, every product acceptance that you're going to be is different and who you do it on behalf of is different as well. So that led to a lot of debate and discussion up front uh, about how best, you know, to get generic best practice that would suit all these sort of eventualities. So that was my perspective on it. But it was a pleasure to be in this team, actually, and learn from so many people in outside industry. So very grateful. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, before we move on to the others, there's a question that came in just specifically for you. From a customer oh. perspective, <laughs> yeah, Tracy, from a customer perspective, how effective has the remote auditing been? It's good because um, obviously we, you know, we, we um, when we went into lockdown, we weren't allowed into a lot of companies yet. We had, we still had to deliver defence equipment, so we had to react, um, you know, with the Ministry of Defence very, very quickly to this. So we did have to put in place processes quite early on. Um, now, after the initial lockdown period, you know, a lot of companies didn't want people on site, but they didn't, they hadn't put in place their own COVID controls early on. So there was a spell of maybe about um, a month or two where we didn't do anything, came up with some processes. But after that, we found it actually quite, um, the, the companies were very supportive. Uh, they'd had time to think about how they were going to do things themselves. Um, it was a steep learning curve for some some of our team, you know, some of especially some of the less experienced um, quality representatives that we have. I think it was challenging for them. They were like, well, how, how do I do this remotely? You know, I won't be able to see things. And, and it was a really steep learning curve. Some of the experienced um, QA staff picked up really quickly. They were quite easy to adapt, quite flexible and um, picked up really quickly. 
Um, and as we went on and on um, and companies sort of started using more different types of software that they would share with us. So we are relying on industry tools um, to use because obviously we can't have a tool that's compatible with everybody, all of the companies in outside industry. So we were heavily relying on the, the software and the technology that a lot of companies had to, to do remote audits. Um, there was only a few areas where we weren't allowed to do remote audits, and that was mainly to do with um, flight authorization, certification and things like that, um, you know, in the, in the aircraft domain. But most other things um, we managed to do quite well. The only challenges we had was perhaps uh, with companies where there were maybe um, concerns about supplier performance. We didn't feel that remote audit gave us, it only gave us limited assurance, shall we say, in, in those instances. But in general, um, everybody in outside industry was really quick, you know, to adapt. And I think it's it's given us tools to move forward with. We will always use remote audits now as part of our toolbox. We, we've got a hybrid approach uh, in place now, you know, so some on site, um, you know, some manufacturing processes, we feel that it would benefit more doing them on site. But it has saved us a lot of there's benefits, you know, on time and travel and all that. So it will always be a tool in our toolbox now, uh, remote remote activities. I don't know if I've answered that question very well. Is that okay? You did, you did very well. Um, another question, meantime, came in. Do you need a customer approval for carrying out a remote audit, especially if their product or process KCs, I assume, if there are product and process KCs to validate? Yes, we did actually seek permission uh, from all of our um, customers to, to use remote techniques. And as I say, there was a few instances in the, in the aircraft world where they said, no, that's not appropriate. But in general, most of our customers were actually in the same sort of boat. Um, they had, you know, I'm dealing with other governments abroad, so they were in the same position. They were having to develop the same things as well. So most of our customers have been pretty supportive. Um, and and you know, the fact that you're still, um, you know, picking up issues during remote surveillance, I think that gave our customers a high level of confidence that they were still getting the surveillance from us that they expect, the, the high levels of surveillance that they expect at suppliers. So, um, but it has it has evolved. I'll say that, you know, there was some teething issues and it has evolved o over that time. Thank you. I have if, if the if next I may, question. If I, oh, go ahead. If, if I may, uh, Gary. Um, usually, uh, you have an NDA with uh, with commercial uh, customers, and that allows you to be able to go in and and perform a uh, a remote inspection without uh, express written permission to do that. So uh, I've not had any problems with commercial, although defense side um, there are uh, other requirements. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, you. We also had had our process. Uh, approved at Spirit through our legal department, our IT department, and um, our customer um, group. So um, we, we did that before we started. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this is I'm... this is Tommy. I just, I just want to tag tag on real quick on on the the effectiveness of of the remote um, processes being used for auditing or product acceptance. Uh, uh, you know, as Tracy said, not all of the quality management system clauses are created equal, right? There are certainly clauses that are preferred to be on site all the time. And there are some that lend themselves to work really nice with using remote technologies. Um, so I do urge folks to consider that in your risk assessment and mitigation plans, uh, the tool that Dennis shared. It really does give you a nice artifact of objective evidence that all of those types of risks were considered and mitigated before doing a remote event. That was a good question. Thank you everybody for chiming in on that one. Um, I do have a question. I believe I'll take this one. It's what do you do if a link to the webinar on the SCMH is not functioning and uh, someone has pointed one out and I just, just so you know, it was the AAM, the Acceptance Authority Media. I just uh, went to my iPhone and uh, turned it on and, and was able to do it. What I'm thinking here is that in some cases, YouTube specifically is not allowed at company sites. So if you're on a personal computer, it might open up right away. A company site might have limits to it. You can ask for uh, the IT to, to go in and, and allow it for specific uh, sections within YouTube. For example, we have our, this is our own IAQG YouTube channel, 
so it doesn't take in a lot of the outside uh, stuff that wouldn't show up on the right. So um, that's one. But in general, it's a good question because say there's anything at all that, you know, it's not downloading right, you see something that's not functioning right, um, please use that contact SCMH button on the screen. It is in all of the uh, the guidance document uh, modules and you will be able to contact me directly and I completely appreciate, don't feel bad for telling me if something's not right, I want to know so I can go in and fix it. So thank you for that question or um, input. And then uh, another question quickly, we only have about five minutes, so I got a couple more questions I'm going to read to the panelists and then we'll we'll wrap up. During a remote inspection, how large does a non-conformance need to be to see it clearly at the level of resolution of 720? Can one see a non-conformance as small as one millimeter or 0.04? Hi, Dan, this is Dennis. I, I do a lot of uh, remote audit and, and product inspection. So um, that 720p, uh, maybe, maybe not, uh, maybe 1080p. Um, and to answer the next question, uh, Spirit uses a software called LibreStream OnSite that allows us to uh, turn on the, the, uh, the camera of the user um, illuminate or actually turn on the light and zoom in. So um, depending on stabilization and, uh, and, and uh, the, the location of the defect and the amount of lighting in the area, um, you could see it. Um, but if you cannot, uh, I would not, uh, I would not push it uh, and go on, I'd go on site. Um, but uh, we, we picked up uh, um, like uh, voids and sealant, uh, we've been able to to see uh, nicks and dings and and um, and the like. So, uh, including oblong holes. So, it, it it depends on your level of expertise and uh, and what you're trying to see. Thank you for responding to that. Um, any closing remarks, Dennis or team? The only thing I would like to say is that uh, we had a, a very highly motivated, highly intelligent team to uh, to work with and uh, who were very open and honest uh, and, and able to uh, provide their best practices. And uh, that information was uh, basically unfiltered and dumped into this tool and and into the, uh, the guidance documents. So. Um, what what you're seeing is uh, is uh, just a summary of everybody's ideas and uh, and their expertise. So, um, if you'd like to add to that, please uh, feel free to do so. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this webinar. Um, we look forward to another series in 2023, and hope you can all attend. Then, have a great rest of your day.